all. Welcome back to Mysteries with Davina. I am your host, the godmother of mysteries, and today we're going to be talking about Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Now, if you're like me, then all of a sudden this woman just kind of appeared into your feed or your television and you were wondering, who on earth is this woman and why is everybody going crazy over her? So, we're going to start from the beginning and, uh, you know, kind of dive into everything that's happened since and, you know, some of the new updates, like her newest series that she did with Lifetime. You know, we're going to go over some summaries of those episodes and, uh, yeah. But before we get started, today's riddle is, what can run but never walks, has a mouth but never talks, has a head but never weeps, has a bed but never sleeps? Stick around until the end of the show to find out the answer. Okay, starting from the beginning. Gypsy Rose was born July 27th of 1991 and was a baby when Dee Dee, her mother, claimed her daughter had sleep apnea. When Gypsy was eight years old, Dee Dee described her as suffering from leukemia and muscular dystrophy and said she required a wheelchair and a feeding tube. The list of medical problems that Dee Dee related about her daughter would go on to include seizures, asthma, hearing, and visual impairments. Due to Dee Dee's actions, Gypsy was prescribed a litany of medications and had to sleep using a breathing machine. She also went through multiple surgeries, including procedures on her eyes and removal of her salivary glands. When Gypsy's teeth rotted, perhaps due to her medications, missing salivary glands, or neglect, they were pulled out. Yet, the truth was that Gypsy could walk, didn't need a feeding tube, and didn't have cancer. Her head was only bald because her mother shaved off her hair. Experts believe Dee Dee had a mental illness known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. If I mispronounced that, I'm sorry which made her fabricate her daughter's ill health in order to receive attention and sympathy for taking care of a sick child. Yeesh. Okay, there's a lot to unpack already, to be honest. I mean, this sounds awful. Just an awful life to live. To have to live the life of a sick person without actually being sick. Oh my gosh the mental stress that that would put on you. I mean, the psychological effect that this must have had on this girl, I can't even begin to imagine. Man, removal of her salivary glands? Jeez, don't you need those? Ugh. I mean, her teeth rotting just had to be awful, really. I mean, I wonder what she did during the meantime. If she just got dentures at that point? Or if those were her baby teeth? I'm not sure. Anyway. When I saw her in interviews recently, she had a full set, so, you know. But then again, you know, dentistry is, is really great nowadays, so she could have, you know, some dentures or something like that. They look fine now, but still, the jeez, having your teeth rot out of your mouth, that must have been awful. Medical tests often showed inconclusive or contradictory results regarding Gypsy's diagnosis, but Dee Dee would stop seeing any doctors who questioned her daughter's ailments and many caregivers went along with what Dee Dee wanted. She had some nurses training so she could accurately describe symptoms, and she sometimes gave Gypsy medication to mimic certain conditions. Dee Dee was also charming and uh, seemed devoted to her daughter. When Gypsy was old enough to talk, Dee Dee instructed her not to volunteer information during their appointments. She was always the one relating Gypsy's false medical history. You know, I kind of was wondering how she was able to get these doctors to go along with what she was fabricating really in her head, and I guess it was her nurse's training that really gave her the most credibility. Dee Dee told Gypsy's father, Rod Blanchard, that their daughter had a chromosomal disorder that had led to her many health issues. He complimented Dee Dee for her devoted care. When some of Dee Dee's family noticed that Gypsy didn't seem to need a wheelchair and asked questions, Dee Dee and Gypsy moved away. Dee Dee claimed to be a victim of Hurricane Katrina, so she and Gypsy received assistance to relocate from Louisiana to Missouri in 2005. There, Dee Dee continued to bring Gypsy to doctor's appointments, and Hurricane Katrina also provided an excuse for missing medical files. In 2008, Gypsy and Dee Dee moved into their new home in Springfield, Missouri, built by Habitat for Humanity. It was painted pink and had a wheelchair ramp. My goodness, this woman's delusion saw no end. 
Gypsy and Dee Dee also received benefits that included charity-sponsored visits to concerts and Disney World. All along, Dee Dee continued to bask in the attention she received for being a devoted caretaker. When Gypsy was 14, she saw a neurologist in Missouri who came to believe she was a victim of Munchkinhausen, however you say that, syndrome by proxy. However, this doctor never reported her case to authorities. In later interviews, he stated his belief that there wasn't enough evidence to act. What do I tell you guys, huh? All the time we see this. People see the red flags and they choose not to act. They don't help. You know what I mean? Some of these things could have been prevented. I mean, my goodness, all this thing that this girl went through. In 2009, an anonymous report was made to authorities stating that Dee Dee's accounts of Gypsy's ailments had no medical basis. They resulted in two caseworkers visiting their home, but Dee Dee convinced them that nothing was wrong. As Gypsy grew older, Dee Dee began to lie about her age, going so far as to alter the dates on Gypsy's birth certificate to make her daughter seem younger. But Gypsy was still becoming harder for Dee Dee to control. In 2011, Gypsy tried to get away from her mother by running away with a man she'd met at a science fiction convention. But Dee Dee soon tracked them down via mutual friends. She convinced the man that Gypsy was a minor, though she was actually 19 at the time. According to Gypsy, Dee Dee smashed her computer and physically restrained her to her bed after they returned home. Gypsy had also stated her mother would sometimes hit her and deny her food. My goodness, it's already bad enough that she's having to live like a sick person and having to take upon all these problems. I mean, gosh, the worst of it's got to be the unnecessary surgeries. I mean, come on. Honestly, I'm still shocked that doctors have to let that happen, you know. Wouldn't you have opened somebody up and seen that maybe they didn't need this surgery? I mean, upon closer analysis? I mean, I don't know. I feel like a lot of systems failed her here, you know. The doctors failed her. DCFS failed her. It's really unfortunate. But, you know, then, as I'm saying, on top of all that, for her to physically abuse her like this, too, as if the mental abuse wasn't already enough. Gypsy eventually managed to get back online. She joined the Christian dating site where she met Nicholas Gojohn. She told him the truth about her mother's actions and ended up asking him to kill Dee Dee so they could be together. In June of 2015, he came to her house and stabbed Dee Dee while Gypsy waited, ears covered, in the bathroom. First of all, I'm already disappointed at the fact that she found this man on a Christian dating site. I mean, okay, based on the stories that we have shared on this channel, I already will stay clear of dating sites for the rest of my life. But, sheesh, this man claims to be a Christian and he's willing to murder somebody? Tells me that he's not right upstairs either. Gypsy and Nicholas returned to his home in Wisconsin where they were found by police. Gypsy had twice posted to the Facebook account she shared with her mother, once writing that B-word is dead. She later explained that she made the post because she wanted her mother's body to be discovered. I sympathize with this girl to a certain degree. I do. Uh, what she went through is honestly unimaginable. I just can't imagine going through something like this. I really can't. Uh, but killing her mother was too far. I know she knows that now, right? But I just don't think she had the mental capacity to really understand what, what she was doing at the time. I, I, I don't know. I feel like because she was being treated like a child, I feel like she definitely had an underdeveloped psyche maybe and just, you know, just mental issues of her own at this point. I mean, you can only handle so much. And this is her whole life that she had to endure this abuse. And it does not surprise me that she had to have somebody else do it. But this was very foolish of her to do, you know, to make this Facebook post and, you know, talk about her mother in that manner too was not really helping her in any case. Um, and I'm not really sure why she wanted her mother's body to be found right away anyway. I mean, if anything, you'd think she'd want to buy herself some time so that she could get away. This decision that she made to make these posts, uh, you know, it's, it was dumb. I mean, to be honest, it was dumb. It was a very dumb decision to make, but that also kind of makes me wonder what kind of a mental state that she was in at this time, you know what I mean? After Dee Dee's murder, many people who'd known Gypsy wondered why she had gone so far as to kill her. You know, I think that's what the rest of us are wondering too. Since she could walk, she could have simply, you know, exposed Dee Dee's lies by standing up in public. Yet Gypsy had been conditioned to think no one would believe her. She explained. 
I couldn't just jump out of the wheelchair because I was afraid. I didn't know what my mother would do and I didn't have anyone to trust. I think when somebody goes through a degree of mental abuse, you know, to this extent, right, it does have an effect on how they view the world and, you know, it it, it causes lasting damage is what I mean. It kind of reminds me of, like, people that get kidnapped, you know? People that get kidnapped. I remember one case, um, jeez, I don't remember the girl's name, but she was found and she was at the police station and they were interviewing her and they asked her what her name was and she could not bring herself to say her name. You know, you're thinking to yourself, if that was me, right, I'm finally getting free from the man who's held me captive all these years. I'm saying my name the minute I can get around somebody that can help me. You know, these are police. She can trust them. But she was just so conditioned to never say her name, you know, for the years that she was in this man's possession, really, that she could not bring herself to say the name. She actually had to write it down. That was the only way that she could tell them who she really was and not whatever fake name he had made up for her. So I think this kind of level of trauma is what played into this. The fact that she didn't just, you know, say, hey, everybody, I can walk. Um, and this lady's crazy. The fact was that Gypsy had spent her entire life being controlled and monitored by her mother. She wasn't allowed to go to school. Although Gypsy was of normal intelligence, Dee Dee told everyone her daughter had a mental age of seven. When they were out in public, Dee Dee constantly held Gypsy's hand, squeezing it when she wanted her daughter to be quiet. Man, the constant pressure that she must have felt, you know? I mean, holding her hand everywhere that she went, always feeling that constant pressure of having to keep up this act, not being able to act normal. Quite frankly, I don't know how she withstood it this long. Dr. Mark Feldman, an expert in Munchkinhausen syndrome by proxy, said of Gypsy's life and actions, and I quote, The control was total in the same sense the control of a kidnapped victim sometimes is total. Her daughter was, in essence, a hostage, and I think we can understand the crime that occurred subsequently in terms of a hostage trying to gain escape. See? I wasn't that far off, huh? I mean, this man said it too. It was uh, kind of like a kidnapped psyche kind of a situation going on with her. As Gypsy's medical records documented the abuse she'd been subjected to, her lawyer was able to arrange a plea deal for the charges she faced in Dee Dee's death. In 2016, Gypsy pled guilty to second-degree murder. She was sentenced to 10 years in prison and served 85% of her sentence before being released in December 28th of 2023. Gold John was found guilty of first-degree murder in 2018 and was sentenced to life in prison. Now look at this other idiot. Throwing his whole life away for somebody he met online. I definitely don't feel any sympathy for this man. This man was psycho. I mean, he was just looking for an excuse, I guess, to kill somebody. Gypsy has stated it was only after Dee Dee's death that she realized the extent of her mother's deception. While Gypsy had known she could walk and eat regular food, she had believed that she had leukemia. Today, Gypsy is healthy. She also said she enjoyed more freedom in prison than in the life she shared with Dee Dee. However, when asked by Dr. Phil if she was glad her mother was dead, she stated, I'm glad that I'm out of that situation, but I'm not happy she's dead. So this would be the summary of everything that has happened up until her release, right? Oh my goodness, that is just a sad, sad, sad statement that she said that she had more freedom in prison than living with her own mother? My gosh. I find myself really sympathizing with this woman. I really do. I mean... I can't imagine having to go through this level of mental and really physical abuse, too. Uh, just that's a hard, hard life to live. And then there's no escaping it. It's a 24-7 situation that she had to deal with. I mean, the only escape I think she really had was when she was on the Internet talking to other people, talking to, you know, men on dating sites, <laughs> apparently. But... The fact still remains that her mother did not need to die. If anything, her mother needed help, needed mental help. You know what I mean? I almost would go as far to say that it's really not her mother's fault that she was acting in the manner that she was. And I think because of Gypsy's immaturity at the time of this crime, I think that's why she really could not fabricate a better plan. You know what I mean? I think because of her first failed attempt at trying to escape and seeing how that panned out for her, I really think that she thought that that was not an option. She was going to have to 
get rid of her in order to be free. So she definitely deserved to go to jail. You know, you, you have to have consequences for your actions. This was not the right road to take. So now we can move on to the Lifetime series that she did. Right, so we're going to go through some summaries of that. It really kind of re-details facts of the case and kind of gives new insights to the things that have happened since then. They split it up into three nights. And so in the first night, the series begins 24 hours before Blanchard's parole hearing on December 9th, 2021 and breaks down the most egregious abuses in her life organized by year and what age Gypsy was at the time. Speakers like Beatrice Yorker, an FDIA expert and gypsy psychologist, Dr. John Matthew Fabian, offer insight into the depths of Dee Dee's abuse of Gypsy. One of the most shocking revelations is Gypsy's allegations of being molested by her grandfather, Cloud uh, Petrie, I think, when she was a child. And this is a quote, At nine, I don't think I knew that it was wrong, but then my grandfather told me not to tell anyone. You don't want me to go to jail, do you? And she also speaks publicly for the first time about her addiction to painkillers that began after a painful and unnecessary surgery. My goodness, this is like one big can of worms. I mean, the further you dive into the story, I mean, the worse it gets. Uh, she's not only enduring all this abuse from her mother, but now her grandfather too? You know, it kind of makes me wonder if maybe she also had this mental illness because of abuse that happened to her when she was a child. You know what I mean? It can be a cycle. I do believe. And I honestly still can't get over the unnecessary surgery part. I mean, I just, what's going on with these doctors? You're just going to put somebody under the knife based on what somebody else told you, not your own conclusions? It's crazy. Honestly, it makes me kind of worried to go to the doctor. They might want to try to operate on me when I sneeze. I mean, I don't know. The painkillers thing now, too. That's rough. I was talking to somebody not too long ago. Uh, they were given out Narcan, which if you've heard of Narcan, you know, that's something to help you revive somebody going through an overdose. Especially, it's becoming popular now because of the fentanyl crisis that we're experiencing here in the United States. So, when I was talking to her, she explained to me that actually, like, the number one way that people end up addicted to drugs is because of painkillers. People have surgeries, they get injured, whatever have you. And they end up going on painkillers, they get addicted, and then it becomes a problem when the prescription runs out and they still have that need. Um, so I just can't imagine. I mean, she had this surgery she didn't even need. My gosh, I still can't get over that. And now she's also addicted to drugs. I mean, my goodness, like I said, the situation, I feel like we, we came here and we just, keep, we just keep diving, diving, diving. Just gets worse as we go on. Uh, during the first night, she also gave more details about her first attempt at running away with a 36-year-old man named Dan that she had met at VisionCon. She revealed that she made the decision to leave after learning that she was actually 19 years old when her mother had been telling her that she was still only 15. The gaslighting she went through as well. I mean, she don't even know her own age. Dee Dee had gone as far as to change Gypsy's birth year on official forms, which alarms Gypsy's pediatrician, Dr. Robert Steele. When he saw three different birth years listed for her, 91, 93, 95, and in the docuseries, he admits that he was the one who contacted the Department of Family Services anonymously in 2009 because he thought she might have been kidnapped. I mean, she kind of was, but she was blood-related. When DFS came out for an inspection, Gypsy says she loved her mother, and they didn't dig enough to find any evidence at their home, nor did anyone follow up. So, as I was saying earlier, the system failed her. So that ends the first night. That's what, uh, you know, pretty much all that was told in the first night. So moving on to the second part, which I don't think I mentioned this, but the title of the series was called The Prison Confessions of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, you know, also in case you want to look it up. It is available on Amazon Prime and I believe the Lifetime website if you don't have cable. We also get to learn more about her relationship with Gojong from the moment they met on the Christian dating website in 2012 to how Blanchard feels about him now. She opens up about a never-before-seen video she made for Gojon to prepare him for sneaking into her house to commit the murder. The video shows Blanchard making a stabbing motion with the hand while showing her mother's bed an uncomfortable gesture she blames on being high on painkillers. Yeesh. 
Blanchard also finally addresses that infamous video of her and Go John in bed in their motel room in Springfield, Missouri after the murder. Okay, this is where my sympathy for her starts to decline, I'm going to be honest. This is feeling much more premeditated. I mean, you know, we already discussed that she was talking about this with, you know, this fellow Go John, right? She asked him if he would do it. That knucklehead said yes. But the fact that she went through and she filmed it, I mean, she didn't actually do it, but she filmed it. She, you know, told him how she expected him to murder her. I mean, that's really kind of crazy. I know. She was high on painkillers. When you're high, you obviously are not thinking straight. But there was still some sort of thought and premeditation put into this. Honestly, she got lucky. She got lucky that she got a plea deal. I still don't discount the fact that I feel like she did make these decisions, though, because she herself was mentally ill. I mean, probably still is, to be honest. Uh, you just don't bounce back from something like this in the flesh, right? Yes, she spent a good amount of time in prison, going to therapy in prison and all that stuff. Uh, but we're talking this much time compared to, like, this much time that she spent in this abusive cycle that she was in. So... Can you really say that she's totally healed already? I don't know. A play-by-play -play of that fateful night, June 14, 2015, is particularly gutting as Blanchard takes accountability through tears. She states, I'd do anything to just go back to that moment in time. There was still a point that she didn't have to die, and I wish I could have stopped it. She had hatched a plan to have her online boyfriend kill her mother after learning that Dee Dee had picked up power of attorney papers to declare her mentally incompetent. She states, I started to really feel like it was either her or me. This is such a difficult case to judge and to have an opinion on, you know, because obviously it's wrong. It's wrong to murder someone. But at the same time, you look at this position that she was in and it's, it's hard not to feel sympathy towards her. You know what I mean? But it's still wrong. It's still wrong. But it is crazy that she was about to get power of attorney papers over her because, I mean, that literally would have left her powerless, really. One particularly heartbreaking punishment from Dee Dee involved putting a voodoo hex on Gypsy. The ritual included photos of Gypsy and Dan, the man from Vision Con that she had tried to run away with, as well as a cow tongue and menstrual blood and the promise that she would never find love and never be happy. Aye, aye, aye. Well, okay, uh, first of all, that's incredibly gross, incredibly gross. Second of all, that's just sad to wish that upon your daughter. I mean, you know, if we're talking real here, I think she was kind of projecting because she herself never really found true love because obviously she and Gypsy's father broke up and I, I don't think she was really happy. You know, I think the only time that she felt any sort of happiness was when people were doting on her for being a good mother. I mean, hence why she kept the racket up for so long, you know what I mean? Blanchard admits through tears that she thinks her mother's curse is real because it's like every time I get close to someone, they leave me. As evidence, she recounts her ill-fated courtship with Ken, the man she got engaged to in 2019 while in prison. Now, this never ceases to amaze me. How people can get not just engaged, but married while in prison. I mean, my goodness here, what are all the single people outside doing wrong? I mean, I see videos on TikTok all the time of chicks crying because they're worried about they're going to die alone. Uh, my gosh, maybe you should become a pen pal with somebody in prison that's gotten married. Ask them what they're... What their tricks are, I mean, my goodness. Another shocking revelation is Blanchard's admission that she shot her mother with a gun that had been purchased as a means of intimidation by Dee Dee. She states, I was afraid that she would kill me. She only realized after shooting Dee Dee about ten times that it was a BB gun. Point is that I was shocked that I pulled the trigger at all, she said. Okay, this is another troubling detail, you know, this is once again my sympathy, you know, it's kind of going up and down here. This, this causes my sympathy to go down again. Okay, you know, she says, I was shocked I even pulled the trigger at all. Mmm, were you really now? Because you shot it ten times, you know, talk about overkill here, people. I mean, we talked about this before, whenever you do uh, overkill, it's, uh, you know, a sign of hatred towards the person that's being murdered, you know? Obviously, she had an extreme dislike for her mother, which, you know, is understandable. But still, this kind of shows us what she was kind of capable of. She was ready to take her mother out. But, you know, it turned out it was a BB gun. I mean, I can only imagine maybe the disappointment that she felt 
when she realized that it was a BB gun, I, you know, and we don't have, like, all the details of, like, how her mother reacted. I mean, what, did she just sit there and take it? I... All right, anyway, moving on. So Gypsy's attempt to run away with Dan led to a series of harsh punishments from Dee Dee, including chaining Gypsy to the bed with handcuffs and a dog leash, denying her food while eating in front of her and hitting her with coat hangers. Ouch. Dee Dee covered up the incident by telling everyone her injuries were from someone robbing her in a Walmart parking lot? Wow, okay. And as time went on, it began to be more clear that I was not going to get away from my mother while she was alive, Gypsy said. So again, I understand. There was a lot of abuse. This, this is ridiculous. I mean, just this beating of her, not, not feeding her, chaining her up, <laughs> telling people that she got robbed in a Walmart parking lot. Uh, you know, I definitely would have questioned that story if she'd have told that to me. I said, really? So you were getting robbed in a Walmart parking lot and they went for the disabled kid and not you? Anyway, but clearly, people thought that this woman was such a dazzling human being that they, you know, thought nothing of it when she came up with this story. Ridiculous, it did. Now, interviews with her father, Rod, stepmother, Christy, and half-sister, Mia, show the support the family had for Gypsy ahead of a December 9, 2021 parole hearing. Christy spoke for Blanchard at a hearing in a move that Blanchard called both meaningful and symbolic. That's another thing, too. Where was her father in all this? You know? So that wraps up night two. Moving on to night three, which is the final part of the series. Uh, they began with the information about the courtship of... Gypsy with her now husband, Ryan Anderson. I mean, gosh, this is mind-blowing, really. I mean, not only did she get engaged once, she got engaged twice, and then she married the second one. Anyway, so we're talking episodes five and six now of the documentary, and they are a countdown to their wedding on July 21st, 2022. Anderson appears in a series of interviews with uh, he and Blanchard telling parts of their love story which is then juxtaposed with the upsetting footage from when Blanchard was arrested and questioned by police. So uh, we eventually come back in the series to the arrest of Blanchard and ex-boyfriend Nicholas Gojon in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Thanks to the tracking of the IP address of those very unforgettable Facebook posts, uh, it featured a lot of police footage, most of which has already been seen by the public, but, you know, they're just kind of recounting everything. And uh, Eventually, she goes on to recount being made to hide in the closet with Go John as full SWAT teams gathered outside so he could come up with the story that they would tell police. But once Blanchard stepped outside to guns with lasers pointed at her, everything kind of fell apart. And I'm not surprised, she says. I was completely in the dark about what Nick was saying. I kept thinking he was going to stick with the story that he created and that our stories would line up and he would be released. And that's not at all what happened. You know, I don't know much about this Goat John fellow, but I can tell he's not a very intelligent individual based on the decisions that were made here. She admitted that she genuinely didn't think the cops would be able to figure out the full story. You know, this goes back to what I was saying about I don't really think that she was... I mean, I, she was of normal intelligence, but because of everything that she went through and being treated like a child, I really don't think that she was at a level of maturity for her actual age, and I don't think she was mentally developed for a child her age. Well, you know, teenager, uh, young adult, whatever you want to call her. So then the moment comes when Blanchard's family and lawyer discover Dee Dee's immaculate and overwhelming medical cabinet in July of 2015. The discovery of a stolen prescription pad which allowed Dee Dee to abuse Gypsy without even needing to rely on a doctor had everyone reeling. Gypsy's father Rod expressed that he felt guilty, of course. At one point he says, I just should have been there. I don't, I wish I would have, you know, I regret that a lot. You know, I was kind of wondering this as well. Like, where was this man while all this was happening to his daughter? I mean, I got to I gotta say this, but he definitely was not a hands-on father. I think, I think, and you know, this happens. This does happen that, uh, you know, he thought to himself he had a sickly child. He had left the woman. He had moved on, started another family. I just don't think he wanted to deal with it all that much, to be honest. Because if he would have been present, if he would have been there for her, you know, first of all, he would have seen the signs, probably. If he would have been with her at any doctor's appointments, you know, if he would have been there when they expressed concerns. Like, are you sure she's really sick, you know? He obviously was not there for any of that. And then, 
She talked about how she said she didn't have anybody that she could trust. So that also leads me to believe that her father was not there for her because she didn't feel like she could trust him. She didn't feel like she could tell him what was actually happening to her. So I definitely feel some type of way towards her father because I don't think this level of abuse that she was experiencing could have been gone unnoticed if he was actually in her life. That's all I'm saying. At Blanchard's preliminary hearing that same month, the home movie she made that proved she was involved in the planning of the murder came back to bite her and it shocked her entire family and her lawyer who called it a very hard pill to swallow. It was then when he realized that if the case went to trial and they didn't win, she would most likely die in prison. I don't necessarily know if she deserved to die in prison. I mean, does she deserve to have consequences for her actions? Of course, and she did. But yeah, I think dying in prison might have been a little harsh. Maybe, maybe just a little bit. In early 2019, after Gojon had been convicted of first-degree murder, partially due to Blanchard's testimony, he reached out to her with a letter saying that he still loved her and didn't regret what he had done. Yeah, see, I got no sympathy for this guy at all. He's, he's an idiot. He really is. And he's obviously psycho. Blanchard replied to end things for good, writing, We're both paying consequences of our choices. I don't want a relationship with you, and I'm happy. You know, actually, let's cut to a clip here of an interview that I just saw that she did. Is it fair that he is incarcerated for life, for killing your mom, and you're out? Well, I'm sure that we both have a lot of regrets. All I can really say is that I did my time. He's doing his time for his part, um, and I wish him well on his journey. I gotta admit that I laughed. I laughed when she said that. I wish him well. What do you mean you wish him well? The man's in jail for life. I mean, you, you know, wish that he has an easy time in there, I guess, but, like, what is there to wish him well on? I mean, it's, it's over for him, really. But anyway, I just, I'm sorry. That did make me chuckle. Uh, and then, you know, also, I wonder how he felt. I really do. I wonder what thoughts went through his mind when it really set in that he was like, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison for a girl I barely knew. And uh, and now she's off married with somebody else and she's got free. I mean, how would you feel? I mean, I would never find myself in that situation, but I think I'd be stabbing things. I would be that furious. Uh, shocking her then fiance Anderson, Blanchard also reached out to her ex fiance Ken one month before her wedding to Anderson because she was struggling with letting go of the man who bailed on their relationship after reading about it in the press. I mean, honey, why would you be surprised? I mean, he sounds like a Fruit Loop as well because he was willing to be engaged with you while you were in prison. You know, I don't know what he was expecting though. I mean, he obviously had to know you did something to land yourself in there. So he was okay with anything else, I guess? I don't know. But anyway, so she and her stepmother, Christy, worried that Anderson would end up doing the same thing. At the end of the day, I'm a murderer, she says. That's just the harsh reality of it. And I always feel like the reality of who I am and the gravity of what he got himself into, he might run. Would anybody blame him? I don't know. He already had an opportunity, though, as Anderson recounts the heartbreak of having to resign from his job as a sixth grade teacher because the Christian school felt he was putting the children in danger by being with Blanchard. I'm sorry, but I could definitely understand why parents would not want a teacher that's married to a convicted murderer to be teaching their kids. Because the reality is, is that uh, nobody knows the extent, really, to which this whole thing has affected her. And this, you know, we might not see things play out until way down the line, you know what I mean? How's she going to react when she has her own child? How's she going to treat her own child? You know, is she going to have flashbacks, like PTSD kind of a thing? You know, is, is she going to struggle with having a healthy mother, son, daughter, whatever, relationship, right? You know, especially if she has a daughter. Uh, you know, so so we don't know how this is going to affect her long term yet because most of the time that has passed since then, she spent in confinement. You know, I can understand that position. And honestly, I mean, I guess this man must be really in love with her because he was willing to give up his job and most likely he's not going to be able to get a job at another Christian school. So, uh, yeah, things are definitely going to change for him for forever. I mean, as long as those two are linked, his life is forever changed and affected. Blanchard gave insight as to why they had to get married so quickly, stating, I don't think that people understand that when someone is on parole, they have to parole to a family member. 
the weeks leading up to the wedding play out like a will they or won't they kind of romance but after receiving her father's blessing Blanchard decides to go through with it an argument three months after the wedding brings the reality of the relationship into perspective and Blanchard saying I don't know how to be healthy for him I said I need help I need therapy and I think that you do too see what I just say people I'm telling you, you just don't bounce back from something like this. So she definitely has some work to do. But I'm glad that she's at least acknowledging that she needs a therapist. Uh, the couple plan to have a bigger wedding now that Blanchard is out of prison with a fancy white dress and Blanchard's father walking her down the aisle. Everything builds up to an uplifting end, with Blanchard's family cheering her on and imagining positive things for her following her release. And another quote from her states, I want to live a simple life that everybody else takes for granted, do simple things, driving a car, having dinner with friends. I want a job, she says. I want to look in that mirror and see everything that my mother said that I wouldn't be. I don't expect it to be easy, but I think that's part of the fun too, and I'm just ready. I'm ready to take it on. Do I wish her well? Of course. I would like to see her fully recover. I would like to see her have a healthy relationship. I would like to see her have a family and that for things to just, you know, turn out differently for her than they once did, right? As my final thoughts, I'll say that I obviously don't agree with her murdering her mother. Could there have been another way that she could have gotten out of there? Yes, for sure. Um, but I think that her mental state, and I honestly think the drugs as well, now that I'm learning about the drugs that she was, you know, high on the painkillers and stuff, I'm thinking that had a big effect on, you know, how things played out as well. It's a, it's a tough case. A lot of people got different opinions on this case, you know. I tried to steer away from watching other people react into her story because I didn't want to let myself get influenced. I just wanted to know the details and be able to form my own opinion. You all are obviously hearing my opinion now, but you know, don't let that sway you. <laughs> you form your own opinion, but you know, I actually would like to hear what other people, what other people think. My opinion is, is that I wish her the best and that I hope that this is the beginning of something great for her. So tell me what you all think in the comments. But wait, there is more. So big shocker here, both of them announced their separation on Facebook in March of this year after being married for almost two years. Now there was this picture circulating around and people thought maybe she was pregnant. She told people she was not because she was like, hey, I wouldn't have gotten matching tattoos with my ex, which is now my current boyfriend, whatever, you know. The point of the matter is, is that she was not pregnant. She got matching tattoos with this man, Ken, and uh, she's back together with him. <laughs> and uh, she got back together with him only a couple of weeks after filing for divorce from uh, Ryan. So, was that a smart decision? I don't think so. She even said in an interview that she moved a little too fast with Ryan. She shouldn't have gotten married so soon after being released out of prison. Well, she wasn't even out of prison yet, but you know what I mean. And, uh, and now she's just going to go ahead and jump into another relationship. I honestly think she should spend some time by herself and just kind of reflect and work on herself. I don't know. You know, I wish her well. I really do. But this, I don't think, was a very smart decision, if I do say so myself. Now, some of the reasons floating around for why she may have gotten a divorce from Ryan is that he was argumentative, jealous, made her feel guilty for spending time with her father. The other story is that he was a food hoarder, his snoring, and uh, when he slept, he was like a human furnace. But, uh, I don't know, you don't get a temporary restraining order against somebody because they snore, you know what I'm saying? And he looked like a big boy, so he probably eats a lot, I don't know. But, before you go, the answer to today's riddle is... A river! Huh? Did you get that one? Let me know in the comments. Thank you all so much for joining me. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you all next time.